welcome to Eye on Piscataway. I'm Steve Kahn, a councilman from the Third Ward here in Piscataway, and I'll be pinch hitting this, uh, this show for Mayor Brian Waller. You can see we're not in the studio, we're outside of a town hall. Uh, it's uh, October, election day is coming up. We're going to dedicate part of our show to talking about the election, some of the changes this year, and uh, how to vote uh, to make sure people uh, understand how to vote. We're going to also go over and take a look at the community center. And we have some other updates of what's going on uh, this month in Piscataway. We're outside uh, Town Hall, actually outside the police station here in Piscataway, and I'm here with Melissa Cedar, who's the uh, township clerk, and uh, she's the, probably the most knowledgeable person in, in municipal government uh, as to how uh, the election's going to uh, run this year. And so we're here to talk to her so that we can learn a little bit more about how this election is going to go. Melissa, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Steve. We're also standing out by the uh, drop-off box, and I have uh, my uh, mail-in ballot in hand. But I want to begin by asking you some questions. First of all, uh, some folks in town probably don't know you. What's your role as the municipal clerk with regard to elections? So I oversee the elections for the municipality. I work uh, closely with the Board of Elections at Middlesex County, who in turn work closely with the State Board of Elections. So this is a process that was followed in the November primary, uh, the, June, the June primary election. It's a little bit different here because not a lot of, not everybody participated in the primary. So let me, if I understand correctly, pursuant to the governor's order, if you're an active registered voter, you would have gotten a vote by mail actual ballot. It's not a sample ballot, it's a real ballot. Is, correct. is that right? Yes, that's correct. So, Everybody who's an active registered voter, can you just mm -hmm. tell us what is an active registered voter? So it's someone who has participated in elections, that their address has been affirmed with the Board of Elections, and there haven't been any sample ballots in previous elections sent back to the Board of Elections. Okay. You can check to see whether you are an active registered voter um, on the website that's on your screen now. So we're, today, right, today as we're filming this is October 6th, I, I believe I received my ballot at least a week ago, yes. and most people that I've spoken to have. Mm -hmm. So if I'm at home now and I and and I haven't received a ballot in the mail and I think I'm registered, what, tell me what I should do. So if you think you're a registered voter and you believe that you haven't received a ballot in error, you can contact the Middlesex County Clerk's Office. Their telephone number is 732-745-4202 and see what the status is or to obtain a replacement ballot. Okay, well, that's another good question. If I got my ballot and I and I, I know this happened in June, I got my ballot and I threw it out. I misplaced it. Mm -hmm. I can get a replacement. You can ballot. get a replacement ballot with the with the Middlesex County Clerk's Office, the Elections Division. Okay, so let's let's talk about the 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 mail-in ballot or the write-in ballot because there's probably a lot of residents that have never done it before. Mm -hmm. So let's let's begin by talking about uh, how you fill out your ballot. I have mine here that I filled out last mm -hmm. night. Yes. But a lot of people are new to this. They've just gone down to the polling place and voted in the polls. Mm -hmm. um, could you just give us, um, give the, the, the viewers at home an understanding of what are the key components, what they need to do with the ballot? So the key component is to make sure you use, uh, preferably a black ballpoint pen. You can use blue, but the machines read the black better. The two envelopes, make sure you obviously complete both sides of your ballot. There's a front and a back, make sure you turn it over and vote on both sides. Then put, place that into the inner yellow envelope and moisten and seal that one. That contains a certificate that should not be detached. You have to sign the certificate as the voter. And then you insert that into the outer green envelope, peel that and seal that, and then you can be on your way to vote whichever way you decide. Right, and so what you should have at home, what Melissa explained is I have the, the outer green envelope and you could probably see through the window is inside there's a yellow uh you put your ballot inside the yellow envelope and you have to sign it uh the yellow envelope is signed it goes into the green envelope and it's already there's already postage on it right correct it's postage paid okay so uh, i'm at home i filled this out we have to be standing by the box but what are the different ways i've now filled this out correctly i've sealed it how do i get it in so it counts so you submit it to the u.s postal service the polling location on election day uh, it has to be. Oh, it has to be postmarked by election day if you put it in the regular mail. You can drop it in our drop box here, or you can um, drop it directly at the board of elections in East Brunswick. So it sounds like there's a variety of ways I can just mail this in in the normal course, and there's yes. postage on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can drop it in the uh, the box, and this is a secure box that's outside the 
the uh, township, actually outside the police department um, here in uh, Piscataway. And does every um, town in the county have one of these Middlesex County boxes? Yes, every municipality in Middlesex County has a drop box. Okay, so there actually are some folks that watch this show that are in some of the surrounding communities. Correct. And you should know if you're outside of Piscataway, you live in Middlesex or some of the other towns uh, that, that are, see this show, that you can go to your municipal building and drop it off there. And the third one was I could actually drop it off um, at one of the polling places you said on election day. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let, let's let's talk about election day mm -hmm. because that's different. People, especially in presidential elections, are used to voting uh, at their local firehouse, at, right. the, at the library, or you know, the senior center, the various places mm -hmm. around town. And that's going to change. That's going to be different this in this general election. Correct. So. Uh, Tell us what the polling places are uh, that'll be open in town. Sure, so um, there'll be four polling locations open in Piscataway and they are ward specific. So you would go as a voter to the ward in which corresponds to where you live in town. Um, ward one voters will go to Quibbletown Middle School. Ward two voters will go to the Piscataway High School. Ward three voters will go to the Piscataway Senior Citizen Center and voters in Ward 4 will go to the Livingston Student Center on Rutgers campus. And we want everybody to be able to vote in town. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to vote. So you're gonna see, we're gonna have uh, you know, various different message boards and signs yes. in town. And we, we should also have um, at your local polling place, say for example, I, I would vote at Holmes Marshall Firehouse. There should be directions at your local polling place if you get confused to tell you where to go. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people are going to think, well, I'll just, you know, I'm just going to vote on election day. I don't want to do this vote by mail stuff. Right. I want to show up and actually push the button. Okay. They won't be able to do that. Is that right? They will not. This is strictly a provisional paper ballot election, which means if you decide not to vote with your ballot that you got in the mail, vote by mail, you'll vote at the polling place by provisional paper ballot on paper only. Let me just, let me, let me ask a question about accommodations on election day. Will there be any accommodations for disabled voters at the polling places on election day? Yes, there will be provisions made for disabled voters at the polling site. Oh, okay. So let me just, you know, a lot of stuff on the news about the election, it's hard to stay away from it. Um, I just want to talk a little bit to reassure people. Now I have a paper ballot, I got it, I filled it out last night and I'm going to mail it, you know, you know, shortly I'm going to drop it in the box. Mm -hmm. But if I decided that I want to still show up and vote on election day, would I be able to do that? Would, would would that be picked up somehow? You cannot vote twice. It's, it's basically illegal, it's basically thing. a federal offense to to vote knowingly vote twice. So if you voted by mail, you should not show up at the polling place and vote provisionally. But they do have a system at the county in which they count the vote by mail votes first. So then your voter registration would be marked that you already voted. So then if you in turn voted provisionally at the polling location, that secondary vote would not count because you've already been marked as a voter. All right, so say for example, I, I vote by mail and then I decide I change my mind and I want to go vote at the polling place. They're going to know that I voted by mail. Correct. They're going to have my first ballot yes. and the second one won't count. Correct. And I and I know these are, there's also a code on them. Every, every uh, voter has a voter ID number, is yes. that right? Mm-hmm. So the other, the other question, so in other words, you can't vote twice because the county's going to see that, correct? correct? The other question that people ask or that's been, you know, um, uh, talked about is how do I know my, my ballot got there? I'm mailing it today. I'm dropping it in the box sure. on October 6th. How do, I, how do I know that it got there and is counted? Sure. So the State Board of Elections has instituted a website. Um, if you check the website on your screen right now, you put in the information it requests on that website, you can track your ballot and see whether it was received. Yeah, that's really important information mm -hmm. because and now it's, and it's easy to do because a lot of people are concerned about vote by mail. It's new to them. Mm -hmm. um, you can go right to the website. We you know we're, we're showing it to you on the screen. Follow the information that's there and, and, and you'll know whether or not your vote got there and was and was and was counted. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess to sum it up, it's a different kind of election, yes. but we're doing all we can to educate people and to um, inform them about, about the process. We're encouraging people to vote by mail, but mm -hmm. as a backup, they can still show up on election day to those four uh, polling places. Right. 
Any other important information as the municipal clerk that you think voters should know? Sure. Uh, one point I wanted to specify was that if you decide to bring your vote by mail directly to the polling location, you may only bring your own ballot to the polling location on election day. You may not bring a family members, neighbors, um, anyone else is it's only yours the poll workers are only allowed to let you bring your vote yeah that's really important information you folks you can't go out and collect everybody in the household or everybody on your blocks uh you know ballot even with good intentions and bring it to the polling place you got to bring your own individual if you're going to do it you, that uh that way you got to do it individually thanks yes. thanks a lot melissa mm -hmm. i appreciate everything you told us here today you're welcome thank you so i filled out my uh my mail-in ballot last night and it's got postage on it. You could you could mail it in, and it, you know, and it, it will get there. But we also have uh, Middlesex County Board of Elections is placed in each in each municipality in the county uh, a box. It's a secure box, and you can drop off your uh, ballot in the box, which is what I'm going to uh, do here today. In the time I've been standing out here uh, talking to uh, M Melissa Cedar, probably seven or eight people came by and dropped their their ballot off. So it's. Um, you know, it's a secure way of doing it. It's right outside the police station. There's a surveillance camera to make sure that nobody could monkey around with the box. And the Middlesex County Board of Elections will come and pick the and pick these up. Um, this is a county box, so you can tr actually drop it off in the box anywhere in the county. Any county resident could vote in any box within the county. If you're if you're at home watching this show and say you're in Boundbrook, you're in Somerset County. You can't vote in Middlesex County. So. I'm going to take my official ballot. It's all sealed up in the green envelope. I'm going to drop it right in the box. And there it goes. I've now voted. We are here at the Piscataway Community Center, which is now open. It's been open for about a week. I'm here with Brian L. Souser, who is the uh, membership director at the community center. And we're here to learn a little bit more about uh, how to become a member at the community center. So I guess, Brian, begin a little bit um, by telling the folks at home, what, what, what's your role as the membership director? So my label, I am the membership experience director here. So I oversee our membership department as well as all of our individual members. And I represent each and every one of them to make sure that they're happy, to make sure that we are doing everything we can in the community to get to serve their needs. Well, I, I guess the obvious question, you know, that a lot of folks would like to know is the first question that I asked is, we've been open for a week, about how many members do we have? So currently to this date, we are at 2,100 individual members, which wow. is about 840 units and, and, and going up each day. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty good success for just a short period of time yeah. that we're open. Um, I guess let me ask you a couple questions about membership. First of all, I'm interested in the community center. I, uh, I, I live in town, but I haven't been here. I don't know what, um, I don't know what, they, what you all have. How do I find out more information? So yeah, we, we offer a multiple different ways to, to learn more information. If you're uncomfortable leaving your house, we offer our virtual tours on our website. And if you are ready to come and visit the center today, uh, you can come in and stop in. And we have any, uh, we'll, have, we'll be here to accommodate you via tour, as well as answer any questions that you may have uh, in regards to a membership type and the amenities of the facility. I know it's a little complicated because the, the, the membership programs and rates vary tremendously. Sure. Um, so, and I don't know that we can go into as much detail sure. as, as needed, but can you give us an overview or summary so the folks that don't have some explanation of generally what, pro, what, what type of memberships are available and the costs? Sure. So we have a whole bunch of different membership types, but we do have our non-resident membership types and our resident membership types to truly benefit being a resident in this, in this community center, in this, in this community. This has been a long time coming for this facility and uh, there is that benefit for our, our residents here. So there are membership types by family, by individuals, and uh, we have all of that here for you or on our website when you go and visit. Yeah, I guess that's the best place to get the most um, detailed information. There's family packages, individual packages that, that vary in cost, sure. correct? Yes. Um, and I think what you just said, if I understood correctly, is that there's a, um, a different cost if I'm a Piscataway correct. resident versus a, a resident from outside the community. Correct, correct. yes. So um, is there anything else that you know, people need to know about, about you know, memberships, how to get more information about the Sure, community? I mean, you could just visit our website. Uh, and obviously with that, our website, our Facebook pages, not just our YMCA pages, but also the townships pages. 
every time we uh, open up something new or new amenities are becoming available, we try to get it out to everyone as soon as we can. Obviously right now with uh, COVID-19, there's not a lot available, but as the co coming days continue, more things will become available. Yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that with, uh, with, with Kyle um, in a few minutes, but while the, the facility is open, there's all sorts of uh, safety limitations restrictions, and restrictions, yeah. is that right? Sure, yes. So for, for the, uh, in regards to, you know, staying compliant with the health department, we, we are, you know, each day living by those standards, health checks at the door, ensuring that everyone is socially distancing and practicing socially, uh, social distance. Uh, and we're doing everything we can, and hopefully these will all be lifted, you know, in, in, the, near, in the near future, so. I guess a couple more questions. I, I signed up and, uh, and registered online on the website. You can still do that? Correct, yes. Okay, you could do it in person or, or on the in website? In person or online. We're encouraging online just because from a setup standpoint, for you to put in your own individual information, you'll be able to do it quicker, but we are here for everyone and we can do it in-house. Uh, so whether you feel comfortable doing it from home at any time of the day, because our hours are limited right now, or if you, you know, can fit in, in your schedule to come and see us in the facility, we're here to accommodate you as well. Well, I signed up online for our whole family. I, I haven't gotten my card yet. I'm excited because I'm gonna, uh -huh. in just a few minutes, I'm gonna get my, my community center, the Scataway Community Center yes. card, which I've wanted for a long time. Looking forward to that. Yes, and, and that's the reason why we have you do that right in check-in, so our staff can meet you individually, take your photo, uh, and give you that card and give you that kind of, that, that first greeting uh, and for your first workout and your first visit. Well, let's go. Um, let's go walk over. And I'm going to get my. I'm going to get my community center card. I'm here in the Aquatic Center with the Executive Director, Kyle Stroman. Um, the community center's been open, I guess, about a week, well, full-time open about a week now. How's it going? It has been a great success, as we've gotten a chance to be able to just serve this community, introduce them to the YMCA, introduce them to this fine facility itself, and with all the different, you know, rules and regulations that we have to, to follow to make sure that we're open safely, uh, carefully and doing all those public health pieces, we still have had an amazing amount of support from this community. Just excitement, getting into the pool area, getting into the gym, getting into the wellness area. So it's been really great because we've been able to have those moments and those conversations. And I think long-term, that's gonna really, really make sure that this is a successful organ uh, operation. Well, well, I'm excited. I, I've been here since the groundbreaking. I was here at various times throughout the construction the ribbon cutting, but this is the first time I've been in here where there's actual folks enjoying the facility and it's really exciting to see. Um, you know, one of the first questions that I, I mean, I, if I asked you before we got on camera, I was concerned with, um, with COVID and things that are going on in the world, folks wouldn't join, but that's not the case. We're, the membership's going very well, right? Correct. I'm, one of the things that's nice about where we're at in the history of, of this incredible pandemic that no one has gone through before is that, especially here in Piscataway, people are really well educated. They really take the time to learn the facts, what they're supposed to be doing, to care for their neighbors as well as themselves. And that has put us in a really good community position to be successful here. So being informed, coming in, being prepared to handle all those things, I think has really boosted people's excitement to get back into a sense of community, number one, but do it in a really safe way. And, and to me, that combination has made this launch very successful and why we're seeing quite a few of the, quite a bit of the numbers that we're seeing. It's just a really great community to serve. Right, I was told we have uh, 2,100 members in the first week of, of operation. That's well beyond what I anticipated that, that we would have. <laughs> um, I know when I came in the door, there was a, a wellness check. You know, I'm sure some folks at home may have some concerns. Gee, I don't really know that I want to go to the community center. What are you, what are you doing uh, to ensure the, the safety and the health of our community? You know, what, some of the things that we put into place are just really good foresight by the planners of this organization. So as this building was being put together, 
I've said this before, there were there were some ideas that maybe that some of our redundant systems were too much. And it turns out that they're perfect for this environment. We've got great air handling systems throughout this, this entire uh, facility. So we can turn over the air with fresh uh, air mix as well as filtration. We're able to, to clean behind people as far as when they use equipment. And we're seeing our members are set up with the equipment to be able to spray down and clean up before and after they participate in something. We also know that the health department is standing behind us trying to make sure that there's a lot of good policies in place. So it's a little inconvenient at times not to be able to use the locker rooms, but our members understand that that's not the time and place that we're at right now. So we also have areas of this building that are just not quite ready. Um, as far as the pool, we are asking members to register beforehand or get an appointment. Then they get their own private lane to be able to do their workout. Yes, it limits the number of people that are inside the facility, but it allows everyone to do it safely. So there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that we've been able to put together that really instill confidence into individuals as they also start to venture back being around their neighbors. So we're excited how that all works together. So that, that, that makes me want to ask a couple of questions. Sure. If I'm at home, I'm a member, uh, and I decide I want to go uh, work out, do I need, can I just show up? Do I need to make an appointment? How, how does that work? So we have got currently a 75 person capacity inside this facility. So when you sign up as a member, you'll have a complete portal that gives you full access to your accounts. Inside that online portal, there's a couple things that you'll get as far as information. Number one is you get to see real time usage of this facility, and it'll tell you if it's 20% full, 30% full, 50 or near 100% full. You also in, inside that portal would be able to schedule your visit here for aquatic lane. But if you're coming to just work out in one of our wellness areas, the 75 person we found schedules are so, so difficult, even in these situations, that we needed our members to be able to have the flexibility of not always just doing an appointment, but just come in and, and have the chance to just recreation. And so both, both of those tools together, they're all within everyone's individual membership portal, gives them a lot of freedom and flexibility to use this fantastic facility and do it safely. So I, I can go on the website and I could see how, how crowded or how uncrowded you know, the facility is at any given time in, in, the real, in real time. Exactly. Okay. So it's a very simple either on our homepage, uh, so at the, at the YMCA at the Piscataway Community Center homepage, you can click our membership usage and it'll give you real time statistics. Or you go into your portal and it'll give you those membership statistics and not only will it show you that, but when it, when it comes down to like the pool area, it will tell you that capacity of the, the competitive pool or our exercise pool. So we feel that by giving as much information and data back to the members, we can really be successful with this launch. So you, some, of the, some aspects of the facility are, are not open because of, because of some restrictions. What, what are those that are not open? So the biggest one that we, we have limitations on would end up being our locker rooms. Locker rooms are able to be used as restroom areas, but we don't have full use of the locker room space as far as showering or changing clothes afterwards. We're really asking our members to come in the equipment that they're going to work out in, and then they're gonna also leave in that same condition. The other one that I, I think a lot of people are asking about is all the programs that we're excited to be able to offer in the future. A lot of those fitness classes, a lot of those kids sports classes, the arts programs, the teen programs, all the things that the YMCA is known for. But at this particular time, at 25% capacity, those aren't available yet. But as we start to continue to see the numbers in our state improve, across our nation improve, we're gonna be excited to be able to offer a lot of those, those additional uh, enrichment programs out there. So just a couple questions about, we're, we're here in the Aquatic Center. If I understood what you said, if I wanna, you know, come to the pool at 11 o'clock, you know, weekday morning, I can register and get a lane and online so I know that I have a spot. Is that what you said? Exactly. So you would go in, you would go in and you're going to reserve uh, your space in the Y. It's then going to give you a menu option of spaces that you can reserve. So it would be the competitive pool and you can do it in a half hour increment or up to an hour's worth of time. And once you book that, you'll get an email confirmation that you've got it and that lane will be reserved for you for that time frame. But what, what if I just decide I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just pop my head in and, and see if there's space available? And assuming that like today, right now in the middle of the day, there's not a lot of use, can I just do that when I'm here at the facility? 
you'll have limited opportunities. So we really do encourage the reservations because one of the things that we've been finding right now is as people are getting back into their wellness journey is that they may register for an hour, but, but swim for 45 minutes. At that point, it looks like it might be empty, but you only have a 15 minute time frame before the next group comes in. And so we will continue to communicate and share that information with members as they come in. But your absolute best way is to go online, book that spot, then you know it's yours for that time frame that you're coming in. So when we built this facility, we built a competitive pool because we understood that there would be a, a, a need for that in the community. I understand the high school is, is making arrangements now to have a particular time to practice, assuming high school sports are, are going to continue. What other anticipated use do you think there will be of the aquatic facility? So we do. We're, we're excited to be able to invite Piscataway High School into their home swimming pool. And this is going to be one of the premier places to compete. So I think Piscataway High School swimming is going to see in it an amazing growth as people realize what kind of uh, place they get to train and, and uh, compete in. But then we're going to start to see age group swimming that's in here. Uh, the YMCA of Musa does have a swim team. So we're going to start to see that build up. But it's going to be a program space too, an opportunity for our community members to learn how to swim. And of course, we always want to leave it up, leave it open to exercise and lap swimming. This is too incredible of a facility to over program what we're trying to do. And we want our members to be able to come in at times and get their workouts in. So between fitness classes, swim lessons, swim teams, uh, potentially scuba out there at some point in time, the fire department's using it as a training site for them. There is going to be a lot happening inside this aquatic center, but it's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to truly represent our community. Well, I can say there was excellent feedback. I'm, I'm a volunteer firefighter and I know that you had a, a water rescue class that was run here and there's going to be more coming up. I, I'm going to actually take one of the classes coming up. But there was tremendous feedback from the, the firefighters in town about the facility. Uh, they were really excited to have it in town and, and to train on it. Um, it's exciting to be in here it's, and, and see people uh, enjoying the facility. Uh, and I, I appreciate your, the experience you bring to this because this, this is still challenging times that we're working through. Anything else that you think the residents at home need to know about the community center? You know what, I, I think you've hit on it. We are just genuinely excited to see the community coming out and enjoying their community center. And I'm gonna keep on encouraging people that we are working tirelessly to make sure it's a safe, fun experience for everyone that gets involved. But we're here because we wanna serve the community and we need people to get involved. So come on out, get your membership started and start to find out how to get involved in this amazing community center. That's why it's here. That's how it's going to stay amazing is by simply having the community all come together and participate in this event. Well, thanks a lot, Kyle. You know, we're here in October of 2020. It's the kickoff of this facility. What's great about this facility is it's gonna be here for residents in this town to enjoy for generations to come. So I'm excited to be here at the beginning and uh, I'm really looking forward to see where we go. It's gonna be an amazing journey. It's gonna be a fun one. Thank you. Thank you. October is Fire Prevention Month, and I'm out here with Bob Gore, who's Piscataway Township's Fire Marshal, talk a little bit about Fire Prevention Month and educate the folks at home on some of the things that they should know. Welcome back to the show, Bob. You've been on this show a number of times. So uh, let me just begin with uh, October's Fire Prevention Month. Tell the folks at home, what does, that, what does that mean? Okay, this is just a reminder, as it is every year, that people should just take time out and learn and just revisit the fire what fire prevention is about number one if for home fire safety we just want to tell you uh quickly is that everybody knows some form or fashion they have smoke detectors now some are electric some are battery some are older and some are newer they did pass a new law that came out quite some time ago that now instead of uh ha the battery life on the new detectors that you go out and purchase are 10 years now the detector, the inside sensor inside that smoke detector, that what senses what's smoke or fire. And at least the, when the smoke detector goes off, that sensor does have a shelf life. That means it has an expiration time. So we're, just because you buy a new 10 year, year battery does not mean that will last up to the 10 years. You gotta check it and you should test it manually. If you live in an apartment or condo, call your condo association, or if you don't know how to test it, ask a neighbor, 
or your, one of your family members, or you can even now look on the internet and social media how to do these things. Uh, as well, the biggest things that we also are reminded that came about is carbon monoxide alarms. They're two separate alarms, but you can buy a carbon monoxide and a combination smoke detector. They work in two different ways. The smoke detector, as you know, creates from a fire smoke. Smoke and hits the alarm, sounds the alarm for you to get out for safety. But the carbon monoxide detector picks up odorless gases. That means something that you can't smell is clear in the air, but it depletes the oxygen from the air. If you have fuel burning appliances, no matter where you live, condo, house, or apartment, a stove, a gas dryer, or a water heater, or, you, or a furnace, those, when you do heat it up or it does get used, sometimes it doesn't work correctly and it gives off this non-odorless gas, so, or fuel. And what that does, it depletes some of the oxygen that's in the air that we're breathing every day. So depleting the oxygen, would you, that can, hurt or it can kill you. So the detector picks up, okay, the, the appliance isn't burning correctly or using it correctly. So it senses off the sensor and that tells you that there's something wrong. Then you can call 911 and public service electric and gas and they'll come out there and check your appliances. And the fire department does have meters where they can pick these pick that up in their meter that there is something wrong of a, some type of gas. Yeah, that's an important point because some people have a detector that may be wired in to an emergency system that would call. But if not, if your CO detector is going off or your smoke detector is going off, people should call 911, correct? Correct. And the fire department, we get those calls all the time. We'd have no, we come out and we'll check things out. And we have a, a, a meter that measures those things, is that right? Yeah, we got the same type of meter, almost just like public service, that they can detect that until until uh, public service arrives. And that would help out. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to tell the residents or and occupants, don't start looking for the problem. If the alarm does sound carbon monoxide or a smoke detector, get out to your safety and then you can use a cell phone or somebody else's or a neighbor's house phone and call 911. Let the professional people, as the firefighters come out, let them check that out because they have more experience and they do have their proper equipment to check that. Yeah, don't be don't be shy. I mean, if it goes off, you really gotta call the fire department. You can't smell it, you won't know. You, you may think on your own, everything is fine, but it could, things could be deadly. Correct. Um, what, what other things uh, should folks know about Fire Prevention Month? Well. The, the month of fire prevention, we, well, it's fire prevention week, but the month should be, if not just the detectors, but making sure that your home fire is fire safe. A couple things are a lot of people, no matter where you live, it doesn't just have to be a regular single family home. Anywhere you all live is extension cords. A lot of people bunch up extension cords one to another. They don't use strip protectors, the surge protectors. But if you have any questions, now they got associates that are in different departments. You can ask an electrician or you can ask an associate in a store, wherever you go to, and see if you can get the answer. Or you can go on the internet and find out, I got this appliance, will this cord, is it thick enough or thin enough? Is there... You can ask these questions and I'm sure you can get the answer. But the extension cords are a great thing. Don't put furniture or any, or don't hide them underneath the rugs. Because after a while, people walk on them or the furniture you can, you can fray the, plug or crimp the plug and eventually it gets worn out and it could fail. As the fire marshal, one of the things that obviously what you're doing and, and you're trying to uh, uh, teach folks now is to prevent a tra a, an emergency or tragedy in their homes. It's probably a good time. You just were given some examples. What are some of the things people could do other than have a smoke detector looking around their house for things that are obvious, obvious hazards? Well, the, the key thing is, is the educational. Now we got the social media, which is a positive thing. You can go on social media and you can look up how to prevent, how to make your home fire safe. You can actually, instead of lecturing, you can actually see for yourself at your own time about how to make your, a, a video of what things that could be in your house and what you can do to help prevent it. So same thing as, as stoves. Uh, your sleeves are rolled up. It's the same thing that we, we teach every year, but there is a reminder is a good thing. Muscle memory is a good thing when, you, when it goes to any type of thing, especially safety. Well, th well thanks, I, I appreciate it, Chief. Um, this is a good time of year for everybody to do a self-check, I guess is what you're telling them, Correct. is that right? 
Anything else uh, that you want to tell the residents at home about uh, fire prevention, fire safety? Yeah, if you do have if you do have any questions or concerns, you can reach out. There's six volunteer fire departments in town. You got three rescue uh, squads as well. Even if you have questions on their end, and you can look it up on the township website, their numbers and addresses or emails. And, and you can reach out to them. Everybody's really receptive to help out everybody in this community. That, that's an excellent point. You can reach out to the fire marshal's how, uh, number or the, your local fire department. You're just uncertain about some of these things. It's not something you're knowledgeable about. Call, call the fire department and they'll be more than happy to come out and take a look and give you some advice. Chief, I really appreciate you spending some time educating the residents in town. Thank you. Thank you. We're here with uh, Joe Herrera and Guy Gasparri, two department heads in Piscataway Township. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the road improvement uh, projects that have been going on in town. What are some of the projects uh, coming up in the future, as well as uh, some of the sidewalk and curb improvement projects that have gone on around town. Uh, guys, welcome to the show. Um, I guess why don't you begin by introducing yourself, uh, yourselves to the residents and Tell them a little bit about what your department does. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first if uh, you're asking. I'm the, uh, the, the director of public works here in uh, Scataway. And uh, basically my department is pretty much the maintenance uh, department for, for the whole town. So we, we maintain the roads, we maintain the parks, uh, the buildings, uh, we do tree work, potholes, and uh, a various uh, number of tasks that, that, that are needed to keep the town uh, rolling uh, and the infrastructure rolling and um, it's a lot of work and uh, we're glad to be uh, helpful to the community uh, to take care of all these issues. Guy, how, how long have you been in that position uh, here in town? Uh, uh, it'll be uh, this year September 6th was 14 years. <clears throat> wow. uh, go ahead Joe, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you Councilman. So my name is Joe Herrera. I'm the uh, supervisor of engineering uh, for Piscataway Township. I've been here for 18 years and I'm responsible for the daily activities of all the construction that goes on in town with uh, new developments, uh, new uh, road projects, uh, full reconstruction projects. I have a full engineering staff on the back that would help with these uh, inspections on a daily basis. Uh, we're pretty busy. We're doing a lot of work in the community. Uh, we're probably going to be going over some of the projects that we had just recently completed, as well as any projects that are under construction and future road projects. Uh, so, you know, the engineering department, it's a pretty, it's a pretty busy uh, department on a daily basis. Well, I know both of you guys. I know a lot of guys that work for you, and we, we could spend hours probably talking about all the responsibilities that you and your departments have. We don't have that much time uh, to do that. So I want to, I, but I do want to talk uh, about um, some of the road projects because they're very visible and the residents see what's going on. Um, so what what are we? What have we? Uh, it's 2020. It's the fall of 2020. What have we uh, completed in 2020? What are we still working on right now? Okay, so let me let me start on uh, 2020. Uh, right now, we just completed the roads down by River Road, Haywood, Winwood, Linwood, and Crestwood have all been you know uh, we installed curbs and a full reconstruction on that on those roads. Uh, those four roads were completed early this year. Uh, the next one was uh, Water Street between Poplar and School Street. We went in there and we did curbs and full reconstruction. That project as well is completed. Uh, we also completed Kroger Lane off of uh, River Road. That was uh, just completed about a month ago. So we, uh, we finished that project. They had curbs, sidewalks, and a full reconstruction with drainage improvements. It, 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 uh, is this, uh, is this our, our employees doing it or a combination of our employees and contractors? How does that work? Now this this all these projects all these projects are done by outside contractors. We have a you know we prepare we have a consultant prepare the design plans, and then we uh, put them out to bid. Uh, we receive the bids, and then the obviously the lowest responsible bidder gets the project. 
and then I have my staff go out there and uh, do the inspection. So I do all the construction management, doing the construction. Uh, so the, the, the roads over in the Possum Town area, I, I know, create some particular difficulty because they're very old. Am I right? Uh, yes, yes, they, they are. Yeah. You know, one of the uh, difficulties that we have with these roads is most of the roads are suburban roads. There's not curbs or sidewalks. So when we come in to do those improvements, it's a challenge because, you know, some of the, some of these roads are either at the same elevation or higher than some of the adjacent properties. So we have to look up all the all those criteria to, you know, design a road to make sure that it's not gonna create any ponding issues or do storm drainage improvements to take some of the, uh, the water that would create those issues, you know, away from the properties. Right, that's, and that, is that our, our engineering department that does that, that type of work? Uh, no, it's mostly all consulting engineers. Uh, my department pretty much does the, uh, the, uh, the inspections of it, and then we just do a design for maybe one or two rows that has nothing really major improvements with it. Uh, the issue is when you start getting involved with some of these bigger uh, roads and doing a design for full reconstruction and sidewalks and all that, you need to go and get DEP permits. And we don't have anybody in staff that, you know, has the knowledge or expertise of buying that types of permits because it's a, a lot of work. What, what, what projects, you know, it's now October, what, what work's still going on out there? So right right now we we initiated the reconstruction of uh, Brotherhood, which is right off of New Durham Road, and the limits are for New Durham Road into uh, Ethel Row, which is actually Edison Township, a little portion of it. Uh, we are doing a full reconstruction again, drainage improvements, curves, sidewalks, and a new pavement surface. Uh, so that's ongoing, as well as uh, the next project is Riverview, uh, off of right next to the Greek Church on, on River Road. Uh, the water company is presently out there installing a new water line as part of their improvements. And then once they complete that, I'll have my contractor, uh, Karosha, go in there and start doing a reconstruction of the road, which again entails uh, curbs, sidewalks, and a full uh, asphalt. Will that be done in 2020 or 2021? No, that project's probably going to go into 2021. Uh, unfortunately, because we're starting to get late in the years and the temperatures are starting to drop, you know, we don't advise of any paving going on. I mean, they'll probably put a base, the base down, but not the top. The top will probably have to wait till the spring. I want to get back to you with some of the future work, but I wanted to bring Guy in, uh, if I could, and uh, tell us a little bit what your department, uh, I know you're, you guys are doing a lot of things at the same time. Why don't you give us an overview of what, what are some of the projects that, that your, your folks are working on now, Guy? Well, when it comes, when it comes to roads, uh, we get a list uh, generally from administration based on recommendations from the public, from myself, and maybe even Joe at times, so that uh, we have a, and, and what our duties are with roads basically is a mill and pave situation where we resurface roads that have deteriorated, but not to a point where they need to be fully reconstructed. Reconstructed is just that the surface has gotten too many potholes, cracks and whatever. So what, what we do, uh, I put out a contract uh, where a contractor comes in to do the milling portion of it. Uh, then I also, uh, put out a contract to acquire material. Um, generally, we, we spend about, uh, every two years, about a million dollars worth of asphalt. And I have a crew that does the surfacing after the contractor does the milling. Usually it's about two inches. Uh, we do get situations where we have to do a little bit of the same uh, stuff that uh, Joe does uh, because, um, uh, there may be a situation where the road is such that it, it needs some kind of improvement beyond just milling and paving. Uh, right now, <clears throat> I have about 42 roads in the queue to do. Uh, this past year was a little rough uh, getting things done between the COVID, uh, utilities being in the way. 
Uh, I also coordinate with Joe. Joe has the contract to uh, redo the curbing where it's needed on, on these roads. And until his contractor gets done, I, I can't do the roads. And I, I know Joe has had some problems with one of the contractors who just started, they had to let him go because he didn't, he didn't do uh, the job he was hired to do. Uh, so that delayed things. But I think um, we're ready to, uh, you know, come off the shoot next, the, uh, next year. We're going to do a few more roads this year. I think we're trying to get Grandview done because we've had a lot of uh, complaints about Grandview and possibly Academy because I think uh, Joe's people are about re ready to finish up the curb there. Um, and then, like I said, next year, we're going to be ready to go with the rest of the 42 roads that I have in the queue. So the folks at home can go on the township's website and see the status of their the different streets in town. Good. Okay, I know we wanted to talk about sidewalks in the time we have uh, left. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a, a little sticky problem because uh, a lot of people think that sidewalks are something that we just generally do offhand. Now, we do have a, a courtesy program. I, I don't think it's written in our ordinance in any, any way, but what happens is if one of our trees, street trees, uplifts the sidewalk, the peop people that live on the street, you know, uh, right in front of that uh, uplifted sidewalk could send us a letter, an email, whatever, somehow inform us that this occurs. And uh, we make a list. And uh, generally every year, sometimes every two years, depends on budgeting, uh, we put out a contract to repair all these sidewalks within that list. Uh, I just want to sort of inform the public that we do this as a courtesy, so it can't be on demand. They have to wait until we get this contract out. So there might be a year wait a lot of times, sometimes two years, and they they have the right to do the sidewalks themselves if, if they really want to, uh, because, you know, for some insurance reason or whatever. Uh, but that's the way our sidewalk program works. So we're just about finished up with the last contract we have and uh, we spend about three four hundred thousand dollars a year doing sidewalks so there's there's quite a bit of work being done and and uh, we do a lot of sidewalks uh, you know uh, on a yearly basis joe i want to come back to you uh for a, a moment or two uh i have one last question and that's sometimes there's frustrating delays that i know are beyond our control why don't you explain to the residents a little bit about that Okay, absolutely, Councilman. Uh, so the reason why a lot of these projects run into delays is, and, and this is what residents uh, a lot of times they don't understand, is that we have to relocate a lot of the system utilities, whether it's water, gas, or electric on our projects, because we have new storm pipes going into the ground to carry the water, the excess water. So this conflicts that end up just the lane that the, the projects are due because of the utility companies not being able to get in there on time to do all the relocations. Now, I had had good luck with the, the water company. The water company has been absolutely, you know, very responsive to a lot of these complaints and conflicts that we have on our projects, and I worked great with them. Uh, the uh, gas company, they're a little bit slow, so I, mm. you know, they, they, take more time to prepare to get out there and do their uh, relocations. And then obviously the electric company, they're the ones that really delay the project the most. Why? Because a lot of times when we do these improvements and we want to nap the road to a uniform cartway that we have on our master plan of 30 feet, then some of these poles end up being on the road and just having to deal with PSC and G going back and forth to relocate those poles out of the road, it just takes months and months. So that delays kind of pretty much puts the contractors at a hole and the projects kind of like died out. So residents start, you know, contacting the town, asking, you know, what's going on with the row, why are they not showing up? Mm. They're, you know, away for like two weeks, a month. You know, well, that's the reason why. And the contractor can't go there and do any work until this utilities are out of the way. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, and I know just for the folks at home is that, you know, we we plan this out way in advance. We tell, you know, PSC and G, if that's who owns the poll, months in advance that, you know, when we're going to do the project, we schedule these things right. and then they don't show up. And the, 
the moving of a we can't move a telephone pole and a, a tele, the moving of telephone yeah. poles and lines is is tricky business right. and um it just it just stops the project dead in its tracks right right joe yes absolutely it does i mean you know they 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 have certain uh the way it works out you typically on a on a utility pole is you have the electric first so the electric psng would go out there they find a a new location for the poles they put the poles in place, then they'll have another crew coming in and transfer the electrical lines to the new pole. After they do that, they top off the pole, and then the next company, which is cable, has to come in to relocate their utilities. Now you're dealing with another agency trying to get them right. out there to do these relocations. And like you said, they've all been notified way months ahead of time, even before the projects went under construction. You know, They have all mm. this information. <laughs> But there are excuses like, oh, we can't move anything until you have a contractor on site. And you have the <laughs> contractors on site, always, there's always another delay that they have. Whether it's an emergency or whether it's something else, whatever it is, you know, they're always uh, telling us some other excuse. Uh, and so anyway, the cable company has to come in, relocate those. Then Verizon has to come in and move, transfer all their lines, and then they remove the pole. So there's like three or four different, you know, utility companies that really need to come in there to, before the pole can be taken out. And that could take a lot of time. So I, I want to thank both Guy Gaspari and Joe Herrera. Um, well, we, I know both of you guys have been on the show before. Uh, you guys and your, and your crews do great work. We could spend an hour or two talking about the important work you do around town. Uh, so I want to thank you guys. And uh, I'm sure I'll see you guys out and around town on the road sometime in the future. Thank you, Councilman. One of my favorite uh, places in Piscataway is New Jer is uh, East Jersey Old Town in Johnson Park. And we're fortunate enough here uh, today to have Mark uh, Nonestide, who is the um, d division head for the Middlesex County uh, Historic Sites and History. Um, with us to talk about uh, East Jersey uh, Old Town and some of the events that are coming up. Mark, welcome to the show. Um, uh, I think most folks in town are familiar uh, with Old Town, but why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, yeah, we're located right here in Piscataway along River Road. Uh, as you mentioned, in Johnson Park, we're a collection of about 15 historic buildings that were uh, relocated to the park uh, back in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, we use the building today to tell the story of uh, the county and our communities. And we do that through programs and projects and uh, the artifacts that we have uh, in, uh, in those buildings. I've, I've been there a number of times. I was there on a school trip uh, a year or two ago. And I live right by the park, so I'm there all the time. And a, a lot has happened in the last few years. A lot of work's gone on, a lot of improvements, a lot of activity. Um, uh, it looks like you're in fact it looks like you're in one of the buildings now are you i am yes <laughs> yep so um tell folks about it because we want them to come out and enjoy it what what do you got going on there right right yeah so you know we've um uh we've been planning for projects and programs of course you know and you mentioned school tours we have a tremendous number of school tours that come through the site you know unfortunately this year with the current crisis it, it certainly has impacted uh, the sites and uh, and what we do, um, we had to pivot quite a bit to virtual uh, programming and offering uh, some of what we do online uh, to the public and to try and use that as a new model and a new format uh, going forward. Um, we're in the process of looking at what we need to do to uh, reopen physically uh, the buildings um, and uh, we hope to get there uh, soon. Uh, the grounds are open and of course, you know, as you know, the park is open and so we do get uh, people that walk through, uh, walk through the site. Um, but in the, in the spirit of trying to uh, move forward and create safe uh, programming to create a safe environment for the public to come out to, um, we've done, again, things online virtually. And uh, we're looking at trying to do something the end of October uh, for Halloween to create a, a safe uh, trick or treat um, environment for the uh, for the public. Well, I, I've thought for a long time that that um, was such an underutilized uh, treasure, and the freeholders are really focused on. And I guess you have in your in your department in the last several years improving the park and and getting uh, the public involved in it. The difference of what it was ten or fifteen years ago and what it is now is just night and day. Um, 
I know one of my favorite times of year, it's cold, but at Christmas time, uh, there's lots of different events. Uh, and uh, I, was at, I was there last Christmas. Uh, are you gonna be able to have that again this year? Yep, we're, we're looking at doing that as well. I'm, I'm glad you noticed the changes because uh, we have we have instituted uh, many of them, including bringing in more living history uh, interpreters. So uh, when people do come for events or programs that there are these living history uh, interpreters talking about the past in a, you know, in a very unique and dynamic way. Um, well, I know, I know I've talked to like Freeholder Tamara and Freeholder Armwood uh, who are big both supporters of the, of the the site and as well as the freeholder director and they've really focused on it um and it's it's, it's been terrific um I, I i believe there's some particular event that's coming up that you wanted to talk about why don't you tell us what that is yeah so for our halloween program um which is uh between october 28th wednesday through november 1st a sunday from 10 to 4 we're partnering with uh, mcfoods um, to use the site as a drop-off uh, location for, um, for, for food items. And in exchange for people that bring uh, food items to the site, they'll receive a, a thank you bag that'll be filled with treats and um, crafts um, and information inside that bag. Uh, again, thanking them for their donation, but also uh, raising awareness about the projects and the programs that we do. Um, so we think it's, it's contactless. It's a, you know, it's a way that the public can come uh, drop off their, their food items, uh, help a good social cause and uh, building up uh, the, the food banks, um, especially at a critical time of the year. And uh, to, um, you know, get a thank you bag uh, as well uh, with, uh, with treats for the, for the family. Well, that's really important. And I can tell you, we're going we're gonna to advertise that on our, uh, not just here on PCTV, but on some of the township social media as well. Uh, it's a great event. Um, I appreciate you being on the show. Uh, hopefully we're going to get, um, I'm not, we probably have, I know, I, I don't recall everything we've done, but we should really uh, spend some more time and do some filming out at the site. Maybe when things open, the, the country opens up a little better. Uh, I'd love to have you uh, back on the show and, and, and get some film footage so that people at home really get excited about, the, it's a real treasure what we have uh, over there in Johnson Park. So is there anything else you want to tell the folks? Uh, at home, uh, Mark. Yeah, sure. No, and I appreciate the the, the comments. Um, uh, for more information, they can visit the county website at uh, MiddlesexCountyNJ.gov. We will have um, uh, an online component for this uh, event as well. Uh, one of the unique things that we're spinning out of it is we're going to recreate the 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast, um, which was a you know a famous broadcast uh, by Orson Welles. Um, and uh, we're going to give it an East Jersey Old Town Village spin. Uh, so we expect the, uh, the Martians to be landing at the village and we will be recreating that broadcast. There's some other interesting components of it as well. And again, we invite the public to visit the county website at middlesexcountynj.gov for, for more information. Well, that sounds pretty cool. I live pretty close by. I hope they don't land on my yard by accident. <laughs> Mark, thanks again for being on the show. Uh, to the residents at home, uh, it's a great treasure. Go out and take advantage of it. Um, and please come out and support the food drive that they're having uh, for Halloween. Thanks again, Mark. I look forward to seeing you down there at, at uh, Old Town. Thank you. Thanks for watching our October show. I hope it was informative. Anybody get out there and, and vote uh, through the mail, whether it's on election day. And we'll be back again in November.